Give you three guesses what I'm preaching about today. <laughs> okay, following Jesus. Good for you. That's, somebody has been here for the last five weeks. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I have been preaching about following Jesus for the last five weeks. But, you know, I, and, and each time I've preached, I, I usually kind of kind of review what the last sermon, the last couple sermons were about just to get you up to snuff. But I thought of something different today. Instead of me reviewing, I'm going to ask for you to review. All right? I'm going to ask for you to review. So I know you all love me and Jesus, and you're not going to be upset with me. So I'm going to, I'm going to call on some people here. Just to, just, and all you got to do is give me one thing just one thing out of the last five sermons about following Jesus. All right, well, I'm going to start with a good friend of mine because your wife types up all my notes, so I know she knows everything. So, uh, Rich Penman, just give me something out of the last five weeks that you maybe have learned. Oh, there's a cost to following Jesus. Awesome, awesome. I'm going to... He sits in the back row all the time, and I'm going to find out why he sits in the back row all the time. Buster Scott is in the back row, so I'm going to, I'm going to go to you, Buster. Give me something here. Oh, we have to deny self. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, you know, my son-in-law is pointing to my daughter. Has she, uh, has she been listening? Well, I want to go with one of, our, one of our young ones because, you know, Mark talks about how our young people have got to stay in here so they can learn and listen and learn. So, Kyle McCree, give me something. What's that? Oh, we've got to empty our backpacks. Take that stuff out of our backpacks. Right, right. That's good. We've got three good ones. All right, I'll give you a break. I'm not going to ask any more. Okay. You know, as a teacher, those are some of the great, great things. You, you, when you ask this or when you're expecting this, you look out and people always find something to do at that moment. I'm going to write that. <laughs> Check the time. Mm -hmm. It's all good. And I, I got, I got, since we're in church, I got to be honest, I planted those three guys out there. <laughs> now, Drew, what were you going to say? Because Drew had his hand up. Okay, there's a, there's the cost of following Jesus is everything, and it's a good thing. Well, that's, that's good stuff. Before we, we get on to today's message, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet regarding following Jesus for those who have chosen to do so, those who have committed their lives to cleaving steadfastly to Christ, in this journey with Him, we don't get to pick the route. We don't. That's part of denying self. See, once we give Jesus the reins of our life, the route taken from that point is all up to Him. Now, He's also not going to tell us everything we can come to expect along this journey either. I'll follow you, Jesus, but first, I've got to know where we're going. I've got to know what to expect along the way. Uh, no. That's not part of it. See, that's where faith and trust come in. <laughs> Jesus says, Come to me. And if we do come to Christ, and if that's what we desire and that's what we do, here's what he does promise to us. Hebrews 13, 5. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. You know, I, I talked last week about how this call to follow Jesus is easy preaching but hard living. Not just hard for those who hear the preaching, but hard for the preacher himself. Because we're all in this together. And if you're anything like me, you experience times where you and Jesus are moving along in perfect harmony. You're just moving. There he is. Jesus turns left. You're right there. Jesus turns right. You anticipate his turn, and you're right there with him. Things couldn't be better. Things couldn't be stronger. My life could not be going on any better. And then there's times, if you're like me, when it doesn't matter what he's doing, you can't find yourself keeping up with him. You're moving along. Jesus turns right, you turn left. Jesus turns left, you turn right. 
Jesus keeps on mo moving. You, you sit down and take a rest. Jesus sits down and take a rest. There you off wandering aimlessly about. That's just part of life. Here's the problem, and here's why. See, if it was just us following Jesus, the new creation that we become when, when God bursts His Spirit in us, if it was just us, the spiritual, eternal child of God, just going along following Jesus, everything would be in perfect harmony. And brothers and sisters, that time is a coming. But for now, the challenge for us is that wherever He leads, if we want to follow we got to drag these bodies of flesh along with us. And for the most part, they do not want to go. It's like these bodies of flesh. See, see following Jesus about as enjoyable as a colonoscopy. <laughs> now, you can, you can blame my wife because she says, Reed, you've got to use more analogies in your, in your sermons. I'm not sure that's what she was going for, but. <laughs> and how excited do we get for something like that, right? See, that is our flesh being made to go places and do things. It just doesn't want to go, right? It just doesn't want to do. You can expect these bodies of flesh to put up fighting with us of some kind every single time we set out to follow Jesus. They can easily wear us down with their whining and complaining. These bodies of ours. I can't do this. Why do we have to go? This is never going to work. The flesh cares about one thing. Itself. What's in it for me? I'm not having fun. And just like with our kids. When it's already been a long day. We're tired of fighting. We don't want to hear any more belly aching. So what do we do? Well, if you're like a lot of people. It's often you just give up because it's way easier. One of the most identifiable scriptures for my life ever written comes from Paul. We've quoted here many times, and I'm, I'm going to give you the, the New Living uh, Translation. It is uh, Romans 7, various scriptures there. Can you identify with anything that Paul is saying here? And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. There's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. So what you're saying, Reed, is uh, I'm not the only one that does wrong even though I want to do right. That goes without saying. Second Samuel 16, 7. We're so thankful for that. Because God doesn't look at the things man looks at. God looks at the heart. So today I thought I'd give to you something practical. For this continuous journey the Lord has called us on. The title of today's sermon is. How to survive when following Jesus. I actually brought with me a survival pack for for Jesus' followers right here. You probably didn't even know there was a survival pack, did you? Yeah. Well, I'm going to share that with you, with you today. You know, I debated whether to call it a survival pack or not. Because, I, I, you know, what I didn't want to do is give you mixed signals. Because there's so many times that I've stood up here and I have preached. God doesn't want us to be survivors in this world. He wants us to be thrivers in this world. After all, Jesus said, John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, Christ has overcome the world. And since he is in us, he reminds us, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The more I thought about it, however, even though Christ has called us to flourish and to prosper in this world, Survivor pack anyway. See, sometimes in the church, we can be guilty of being a bit hyper-righteous. <laughs> it's hard to believe, I know. If we're not careful, we can inadvertently load people down with expectations and obligations without taking the time to truly know their situation. The more I meet with people, 
and listen to them as they share their lives with me, the more I come to realize that lives can't always be quick fixed and sent on the fast track of following Jesus with a timely scripture verse thrown their way. Life's complicated. Life's hard. Life is challenging. It's grueling. Often painful. And at times, for some people, it just seems intolerable. See, it's easy for a preacher who's blessed with the life that I have, living right now where I'm at, to preach a yoke of guilt on people who might be at the present time living less than dynamically for Jesus 24-7. The truth is, I've come to learn that there are times, even for born-again believers, mind you, when surviving is not only acceptable, that surviving is downright commendable. Matter of fact, there are times when surviving might be by far the best option you got. And if you find yourself there, my word to you is, come on. You can do that. Hang in there. One more hour, one more day. The dawn, brothers and sisters, is coming. You ever been there? Maybe you're there now, hanging on by your fingernails, not sure you can go on from this point, not sure you want to go on from this point. Maybe your only prayer for this day is that this day be over. See, those times don't translate too accurately as thriving experiences. See, it'd be nice to live every day as super Christian. Really would be. I haven't had an average day since I came to know Jesus. For me, every day is a Christian holiday. <laughs> okay, that's good for you. I'll be praying for you for this need you have to just blatantly lie. Because <laughs> I don't care who you are, reality says every day is not a Christian holiday. Come on, Reed. Doesn't, God doesn't want us treading water. He wants us all to be Michael Phelps's. Well, that theory, while it sells a lot of books for some TV preachers, it's not scripturally accurate. As if it were, then why does Jesus warn us of the difficulties we're going to face as we follow Him? Matthew 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. That's why the world hates you. 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, be surprised at the painful trial your experiences of something strange were happening to you. And four verses later, if you suffer as a Christian, praise God. See, that's more like reality. The world is anything but friendly to Christ followers. All we have to do is remember how friendly the world was to Christ himself. See, if we want this world to be friendly to us, make our lives more simple easier, guess what? It's going to first take us becoming more friendly to the world. And that's anything but what James has called us to do. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. To be friendly to the world takes us compromising almost everything that God has called us to believe in. We're seeing that more and more. It's impossible to be walking directly behind Jesus, cleaving steadfastly to Him, having our, li our lives conform to His likeness, while at the same time drifting off, embracing and shaking hands with the world. See, Paul tells us, Galatians 1.10, Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. We talk all the time about this battle that Christ's followers are continuously called to fight. See, it's not that we go out looking for it. No, we don't need to because it comes looking for us. And here's why. We're the aliens. We're the foreigners, the outsiders. We're the ones that don't belong here. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1. He calls himself an apostle, and then, he, and then he directs this to others. 
Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect strangers in the world. Strangers, pavarakos, is the word in the Greek for strangers. And here's what it means. One who lives in a place without the right of citizenship. That's who we are. We don't have a right of citizenship in this world. And here's why. 1 John 2.16 tells us, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. As followers of Jesus, those who are reborn from our spiritual Father, we are a distinct minority living amongst a majority who follow a different set of guidelines, customs, we operate out of a completely different mindset than the rest of the world. And that translates to one thing for all of us who are committed to living for Jesus. Conflict. See, that's, that's a word Jesus' followers better get used to experiencing. Conflict. Now, when Peter addressed God's elect as strangers in the world, he was referencing those living in Asia and Galatia in Cappadocia, but the word he wrote is intended to address all believers everywhere. So we're all strangers. America might be the land of the free and the home of the brave, but it's rapidly showing itself to be a country a lot like Galatia, in Cappadocia, where the majority of its citizens oppose God and God's people. Read the history books, or the history book, my brothers and sisters. See, there's no mention of the USA being a part of the kingdom of God. Now, that's not being negative. That's not being anti-American. I love this country. I love living in this country. I'm grateful beyond words for what the brave men and women have done for me so that I can live in freedom and have the liberty that has been sacrificed for me. I can't ever imagine living anywhere else. But see, maybe it's time for Christians to stop waiting around for the government to change the culture. Maybe it's time for us to quit Expecting politicians to govern us by the principles in the Bible. See, they're not the ones called to change things. Nick's been preaching it. The key is, have you been listening to it? The world. Specifically for us, because we live here, this country, America, is not the kingdom of God. And see, that's our true home, God's kingdom. That's where we long to be. That's where this conflict between God and evil will one day end. But see, until God brings His kingdom here or brings us to His kingdom, we're going to find ourselves in one battle after another. This is a broken, sin-filled, violent world that we live in. And it's bent on destroying any and all semblance of God. Now listen, when I reference world, I want you to understand, it's not the world of people. It's not even God's created world that I'm referring to. It's the realm. It is the spiritual dominion and the operation of sin in the world controlled by Satan and organized against God and His righteousness. It's not of flesh and blood, but of spirit. It's unseen by the physical eye, but very much a reality for us in the spirit. And it's the goal of this worldly evil realm to render every follower of Jesus Christ spiritually ineffective as a witness for the Lord. That's what we can't let happen. Regardless of man's laws, we cannot let that happen. Since Abraham, over 4,000 years ago, the people have God, of God have attempted to demonstrate to all of God's creation just who God is and how much God loves us so. The enemy hates that. You ever think that? When we espouse the love of God, the enemy hates us doing that. So the enemy will do everything in its power to thwart those plans. And if that's you, telling people the way to the Father is through His Son, Jesus Christ, if that's how you've chosen to live your life, then the enemy is going to dislike you. What did Jesus say? If the world hates you, Keep in mind, it hated me first. What we have to come to grips, grips with, what we have to be okay with, 
is as I follow Jesus, as I commit my life to conforming wholly to His example, I am going to be fundamentally opposed. And the moment we come and accept that truth, then we can begin the day-to-day effort of living sold out for Christ, following Jesus in freedom, never looking back over our shoulder of what we've given up or who's opposing us, because you know what? That stuff no longer matters. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is not opposed to people coming out of the closet. He just wants those people to be his faithful followers. Okay, so what's in the survival pack? Well, let's take a look. It's really not all that much. Mm-hmm. The world thinks that born-again Christians are all pacifists. That bugs me. Anti-war, anti-conflict, non-fighters. There's even a mentality that born-again Christians don't make good professional football players because they're nature to non-violence. That angers me. How wrong the world is. Born again believers are some of the greatest fighters this world has ever known. It's just that we don't fight like the rest of the world fights. See, there's nothing in Scripture suggesting uh, that we live in this world as pacifists. Hey, if the enemy wants something, just let him take it all from you. Read, doesn't, doesn't Scripture tell us if someone strikes you on the right side, then turn to them the left side also? Yeah, it does say that. But Jesus was not attaching virtue to pacifism or condemning self-defense against anyone who would put you or your family in physical harm. He was making a spiritual point of not seeking vengeance against those who oppose you. See, the Greek verb for strikes you meant with the back of the hand. It was meant as an insult to you. And if someone insults you, you are not to insult them back. Boy, how that has got out of context. To think that Jesus wants us to lie down while the enemy rises up against us, that's ridiculous. How will that attitude cause you to overcome this world? Because that's precisely what Jesus has called us to do. Luke ten nineteen, I have given you authority. To overcome all the power of the enemy. Authority. Exousia. And it means the power of of him whose will and commands must be submitted to and obeyed by others. The enemy must submit to the power of God that is in us. It's not that we're non-violent, no. Born again Christians, if they are to survive, let alone thrive in this world, better have a pro-conflict mindset. Because our enemy, here's our enemy. Our enemy has zero mercy. Our enemy couldn't care less about destroying your life or the lives of your children and your, your family and all your loved ones. And our enemy will never relent. So, the enemy has to be subdued. The enemy has to be forced into submission. If you think we're called to to lay down as the enemy tramples over us, you're reading a different Bible than me, and you're following a different Jesus than me. Jesus' followers better be of the expectation that there's going to be a battle of some kind in their life every single day. And then follow that up with, and it's going to be my goal to win every single one of those battles. Okay, so why the boxing gloves, right? I thought our battle was not flesh and blood, but spiritual. It is. The gloves are symbolic of what we need to do in order to subdue and to beat our enemy into submission. 
It's not my idea. It was Paul's idea. 1 Corinthians 9, 26, 27. Here's what he said. I do not fight like a boxer beat in the air. No. I beat my body and I make it my slave. See, Paul was a jock. Yeah, I like Paul. He's a jock. And he used all kinds of athletic analogies to make his point. And here he's using the figure of boxing to represent the Christian life. Shadow boxing is not going to do him any good. No. So what does he do? He beats his own body. In other words, he severely disciplines his own body in order to subdue it and to bring it under control. All fighters, all great athletes know they need to go through incredible training in order to prepare their bodies that when the time of the battle begins, their bodies won't turn on them and cause them to give up or cause them to quit or to lose the fight. Listen, last week we talked a lot about how this old flesh nature is our enemy. It wants what it wants, which is to seek self-satisfaction at any cost and avoid anything that would, that would cause it not to get its own way. Following Christ opposes what the flesh wants to do. So to make the flesh do what we want it to do, Paul says, it's got to be trained. You've got to train your bodies. He said, I beat my bodies. I buffet my body. The body must be made to serve the Spirit. Luke 10, 19, again, I have given you authority, children of mine, to overcome all the power of the enemy. So as the one with all the authority, it's up to us to wield these gloves against our own flesh in order to subdue it and to discipline it, to make it obey to the point of this body becoming the slave of my spirit. So how do we discipline it? Every time we read and study the Word of God, that's discipline. Worship, fellowship, quoting Scripture. We're preparing for the next battle of the flesh. You've got to think about what, what, do, what do our football players do during the month of August? They call it two-a-days. It's called an acclimation period. Because if they just showed up and played their first game, it would be done for them in the first quarter because their bodies aren't ready. Their bodies aren't prepared. They haven't disciplined their bodies in order to go through what they need to go through of the battle. That's us. We can't just show up against lust and expect it to be gone and expect to beat lust or greed or selfishness or, or jealousy or gossip. Just show up. You can beat it. No, you've got to buffet your body. You've got to prepare it. You've got to discipline it. I've got to read the Word. I've got to be in meditation, in prayer. I've got to do all those things. I've got to beat my body. I've got to buffet it. I've got to get it ready for when the battle comes, then I can, I can overcome the battle. That's the, that's the whole analogy of, of what Paul was saying. We're not strong enough in and of ourselves to win these battles. The enemy is stronger than we are in our flesh. But not stronger than who we are in our spirit. So if the spirit can make the body a slave to it, then we will live our lives by the word of God. So what else, what else we got? Yeah, first aid kit. We're going to have to treat our wounds. Because you know what? We're going to get wounded. In this battle, we are going to get wounded. Our pride is going to get punched. Our ego is going to get bruised. That's just the way it is. Pummeled by persecution. I'm just letting you know this. It's going to hurt living amongst people who want to hurt us. So we've got to be able to treat. Our own wounds, battle scars, whatever it is that you want to call them. 
just set out knowing, okay, you know what? I'm going to have a scar of sarcasm on me for what people are going to say about me. It's okay. We can handle it. There's one more thing. It's Tao. Before I tell you what we want to do with it, I'm going to tell you the last thing we want to do with it. And that is to throw it in. And that can be easily done because of how hard living in this world is. You know what? I can't do this anymore. I just want to throw in a towel. No. Here's what we're to do with the towel. We're to take our brother. We're to take our sister. Just like you people were during praise and worship up here. And we're going to lift them up. We're going to encourage them. We're going to bring them over here. We're going to set them on the stool. And we're going to go, come on, brother. Come on. Come on, sister. You can do this. I know you can do this. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I've seen you at your best. And I know this can be done. I know you can accomplish this. With man it's impossible. But with God all things are possible. See, that's what we're going to do for one another. Because you know what? One day, it's going to be our turn to sit on the stool. And we want our brothers and we want our sisters coming around us, encouraging us, lifting us up, getting us to move on, to make it one more day, one more hour. You can do this. You can do this. Life is fleeting. It's but a mist. Before long, you will be living in the kingdom of God. So, we are hard pressed on every side. You can put that up. But we're not crushed, brothers and sisters. No. We're perplexed. We're not in despair. Despair means that we don't have any hope. We're persecuted. But, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. We will not be abandoned. And we are struck down. But listen to me. All of you who feel struck down right now. You are not destroyed. For God will not let that happen. Struck down, yes. We might have to get ourselves up off the canvas more than once. Six count, seven count, eight count, nine count. Come on. And we get up. Because that's who our God is. He will pick us up every single time. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, that as you planned this entire realm of life out for us after the fall. You've given us the opportunity to come back to you. And we know that the opportunity that we have is through your son Jesus Christ. He and he alone. And Father, as it is your plan or your desire for all of us to dwell in your presence... You've also given us everything we need to survive this world until we do. So Lord, I just want to thank you for your courage that you have given to us. For we remember our brothers and sisters across this world who are being persecuted physically every single day. And we pray for them. And we pray for our brothers and sisters in this room as well as they are being persecuted and sometimes emotional persecution, mental persecution can hurt more than physical persecution. So we pray for you to start that healing process. Use us to come around all those who need an encouraging word. Let us encourage one another all the more as we see 
the day approaching. We pray this in the magnificent name of Jesus now and forevermore. Amen, amen. and amen. Praise the Lord.